Many of you would be familiar with a guy named Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary in the 19th century to China. He sort of set a bit of a precedent for modern missions. He took on this cultural adaptation model of becoming very much like the local populace. This was different to how other missionaries of the time tended to act. And the church historically acted this way of coming in and bringing in cultural tendencies from European tendencies of cathedrals and um, Western dress and Western language and expecting everyone to speak in Latin and follow their worship uh, tendencies. But, but Hudson Taylor set a different precedent. He came in and he adopted Chinese culture and lifestyle. And this helped him gain the trust and the respect of the local people. He connected powerfully with the Chinese people that there's still um, a decent church growing in China despite the um, significant oppression there. But he understood a key idea. Uh, to a Christian, there is no personal preference, there's no right, there's no tradition that is more important than bringing salvation to the lost. He exemplified the principles that we're going to explore this morning in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. We're going to explore three principles that, that Paul lays out in this chapter. The first principle is that ministers and apostles of God have the right to compensation. It's the duty of the church. So if there's a duty, there's an if there's a right, there's an obligation. And so it's the duty and obligation of the church and her members to facilitate that right. That's the first principle. The second principle is that we are called to preserve our gospel witness. A faithful Christian, whether they're a minister or not, should be willing to sacrifice their rights, their preferences, and their entitlements to maintain that gospel witness. Paul is going to show us how he lays aside his right to compensation in Corinth for the sake of his gospel witness. Principle number three is that for believers, the spread of the gospel or the proliferation of the gospel should take priority over all matters of life. There's nothing more important to Paul than seeing the gospel that he holds so dear spread out across the Roman world. So for you, those of you who like alliteration in three points, we got payment, preservation, and proliferation. I did have to sort of wrangle that, but we'll get there. Um, let's dive into the text and we'll see what God has to say for us this morning. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's like seven minutes to read the whole passage, but we'll work through it sort of line by line and, and we will read the whole thing, just not in one go. A couple of weeks ago, Don preached on chapter 8. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And one thing we, uh, we saw in there is that the Christians in Corinth, those that had knowledge of the saving, like they had saving knowledge of God and this understanding that um, the gods of that time, so if you offered uh, food to gods, um, though that food had no, no moral significance. It wasn't a big deal to eat food offered to idols. Those gods had no spiritual power. They weren't, God was stronger or there were no gods. Um, but others weren't, weren't comfortable with this. If you tried to convince these Christians to eat food offered to idols, they were uncomfortable. There's a couple of reasons why that might have been the case. Um, some Christians might have had this understanding that the gods still had some power over their lives, or they were concerned about Jewish, pu Jewish purity laws, um, that you know they couldn't eat food offered to idols or non-kosher food. Or it reminded them of their past idolatry. They still had this sort of lingering guilt about their previous actions as a non-Christian and you know, re reliving that made them feel uncomfortable. But Paul's counsel to these strong and weak believers wasn't just, it's fine, don't worry, there's no, there's no power in it. Um, God's provided this meat for you. Just eat it, get over yourself. His message actually is to the stronger Christians that they should prioritize loving other Christians and being sensitive to their conscience. They have the knowledge. They know that they can eat the food. They're strong in their conscience. They know exactly what it's all about. But for the sake of weaker believers, they're called to refrain from eating food offered to idols. And this is the guiding principle that love should override your personal freedoms. It's better to abstain than to allow a fellow brother to stumble. 
And in chapter 9, Paul is going to continue this theme that love takes precedence over any rights a believer may have. We'll look at the end of chapter 8 and then go into verse chapter 9. Because remember, these, these chapter divisions were added at a much later date. This was added by a guy called Stephen Langton in the 13th century. He was an English scholar, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he added these chapter divisions just to make it easier to find your way around the Bible. But this is one cohesive thought. So starting in chapter 8, at verse 13. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fail, I will never eat again meat, never again eat meat, so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? So he comes out with four rhetorical questions proving that he is the ultimate rights holder. If anyone has the right to eat food offered to idols, it's Paul. He's an apostle. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He has the right to. And he continues that line of thinking. He doubles down on that logic. And he sets an example from his own life. He willingly casts aside a right that he has. But first he, he overproves what that right is. Is, and that's his right to payment. Look at verses 3 through 7. My defense to those who examine me is this. Don't we have the right to drink and eat? Don't we have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers and Cephas? That's Peter. Or do only Barnabas and I have no right to refrain from working? So other apostles, they were on their missionary journeys, spreading the gospel far and wide, fulfilling the Great Commission, and they'll bring in their wives and their children, it seems. And the churches around, as they were going around planted churches, the churches would provide for them. They'd give them food. They'd give them accommodation. They'd give them probably money, spending money. But Paul, we see from other passages in Scripture, had a tendency to say, to say no to this sort of payment. Uh, we saw in Acts chapter 13, where it says, uh, chapter 18, sorry, where it says this. After this, he went to Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. Or in 2 Thessalonians 3, where he says, we were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. There's probably a couple of reasons why Paul had this general principle of not getting paid. But the most common one come up with by scholars is that it was just more expeditious for Paul to not have to worry about getting paid here and there he could just work and get his money and then just move on to the next place and just be real quick about his missionary journey. He was a guy who was just devoted life and soul and body to this mission. But this is especially the case in Corinth. He is, above anywhere else, it seems, he was more hesitant to take money from the Corinthian church. In 2 Corinthians 11, it shows that he accepted money from the Macedonian church so that he wouldn't have to take payment from the Corinthian church. And why does he feel so compelled to refuse payment? We will get back to this question, but right now Paul is making his right to that payment exceedingly clear. He uses more radical question, rhetorical questions. He's leading them down this logical path uh, people used to get annoyed at me when I used to use this style of argumentation. It's really frustrating to sit on the other side of it where people ask rhetorical questions like the only way you can answer is yes or no. And it's, it's a really frustrating way of argumenting. But Paul does it and he's very good at it. Look at verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat fruit? Or who shepherds a flock and does not drink the milk from the flock? When we hear it, it's pretty clear what Paul's point is, isn't it? When I was a young teenager, uh, my first job was cherry picking in the Adelaide Hills. Um, I worked, made the mistake of working with my best friend, um, which didn't work well for our efficiency, but we spent most of our time throwing cherries at each other, not into the bucket. Thankfully for the cherry vineyard owner or cherry orchard owner, they paid us by the kilo, not by the hour. So we worked, it worked out to like four bucks an hour. It was awful. But we still got paid for our work. But the principle is no one works for free. 
right? If you own a business and you stop pay paying any of your employees, what's going to happen? You're going to get a letter from the Fair Work Ombudsman and you know, they're going to enforce their right to payment under the Fair Work Act. And Paul makes this even clearer. He appeals to the Old Testament. He's just continuing down this logical path. Of, I'm, and he's, so verse 8, am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law also say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Is God really concerned about oxen? Isn't he really saying it for our sakes? Yes, this is written for our sake because he who plows ought to plow in hope and he who threshes should thresh in hope and sharing the crop. Then look at verse 13. We will get back to 11 and 12 in a moment. Don't you know that those who perform the temple services eat the food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the offerings at the altar? So this points us back to Deuteronomy 25. He's not saying that the Old Testament Jews could have ignored that law and not and muzzled their ox, right? He's not saying that. What he is saying that there was that God in his infinite wisdom and his progressive revelation had a deeper meaning than Moses even understood. He also says that temple workers are paid. Look at the Torah in Numbers 18 and other Old Testament passages. It makes it clear that the Levitical priests, the sons of Aaron, are entitled to a portion of the grain and the oil sacrificed to God. And he makes this point clear in verses 11 and 12. This is what he's leading to. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much if we weep, reap material benefits from you? If others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? Then look at verse 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. Paul and ministry workers have the right to compensation. As I said before, where there are rights, there are obligations. This is a fundamental principle of ethics, a basic rudimentary principle of ethics. Um, one, of the, one of the things that came up in my international law studies is that this idea of right to food. We, we believe that everyone has this right to food. I want everyone to have food in the world. If everyone, the challenge is, if everyone has an intrinsic right to food, on whom does the obligation to provide that food lie? Is it on the local county? Is it on the state government, the national government, the United Nations? Is it the rich country should provide for the poor? That's the question. Is it, so if, everyone, if everyone has this right to food, who has to provide it? Now, I don't have a solution to that problem. Lawyers have been debating this for a long time. But the point is, rights don't exist in a vacuum. To be remotely meaningful, there has to be a cor corresponding obligation. And I think that principle still applies today to ministry workers. I think ministry workers have a right to be paid in accord with their time and effort. And I think there is a corresponding obligation on the church and to members to facilitate that right. It's not the right of the church or any individual to actually withhold because they want to. It's actually on the... Op the yeah. Um, I don't think Paul is setting up an expectation that ministry workers should refuse. Most apostles at this time seemed more than willing to take payment. I don't think Paul calls them out. I think if he had a problem with it, he would rebuke them. But he seems very comfortable with the fact that ministry workers are paid. He just refuses himself. But the discretion lies on the right holder, not the obliged party. We do need to be careful with this, don't we? This is a challenge that the church has faced, especially in recent times, where past pastors are demanding huge paychecks to fund their luxurious lifestyles, to get their jets, to get their Bentleys, to get their mansions. Paul's not talking about them. He's talking about ministers who work a normal job and are paid a normal amount. Paul's point is that there is an obligation and he wants to overprove this point that he has this right to payment. He has the right, but he chooses not to exercise it. So that's the second principle. Faithful Christians and ministers should be willing to sacrifice their rights to maintain their gospel witness, to preserve the gospel witness they have in their local context. 
Look at the rest of verse 12. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. That's Paul and Barnabas. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. So Paul's forsaken his right to payment for his labors because he feels the necessity to preach the gospel free of charge. There's this internal, irresistible force that's burning up within him. It's like when a co-worker charges into your office and has to spill the tea. That's a term I learned recently to my shame. This, this, this burning up, this, you've got to share the goss. And that's the gospel to Paul. He has to share it. it can't, he can't contain it. It's too juicy. Look at from verse 15. For my part, I have used none of these rights, nor have I written these things that they may be applied in your case. For it would be better for me to die than for anyone to deprive me of my boast. For, I, for if I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I am compelled to preach. And woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if unwillingly, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? To preach the gospel and offer it free of charge and not make full use of my rights in the gospel. There's a few things to note from this. Paul's not trying to guilt the Corinthian church into giving him cash. I think he's got a bigger point than that, but he's definitely not trying to guilt them into more, nor am I this morning. We will see in a moment what that point is, but there is the second point, the second, the second idea that I think is worth hitting down on, that there are some really interesting similarities between Paul and the Old Testament prophets. There's this compulsion to speak. Paul had this compulsion to bring the gospel to all people. I think this echoes Jeremiah, where it says, like Paul, like, so like, God, like, like Paul, God's, Jeremiah was God's vessel and he was to bring God's message to the world. An example of this is Jeremiah 20, which in verse 7 says, O Lord, you are stronger than I am. Verse 8, when I speak, the words burst out. Verse 9, but if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. He expresses this sense of doom if he can't deliver the message. This is like Paul's declaration in verse 16. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Abraham Heschel puts it this way. The prophet does not volunteer for his mission. It is forced upon him. He is seduced. He is overwhelmed. There is no choice. He can't help but obey. He's compelled, driven. He's bursting at the seams, holding this in. So he can't boast. He has no pride in this matter. It's just part of who he is. And that's the call on us as believers as well, I believe, to, to be so filled with the gospel that we can't help but share it with our friends and co-workers. And it comes at a personal cost. Paul sacrificed his work, his study, he, he had to preach, he had to be shipwrecked, he was jailed, starved, beaten. He had this innate calling on his life. He suffered isolation and suffering for the sake of the gospel. And he was more than willing to do it. He delighted in his sufferings because it showed God how committed he was. He took pride in the fact that he was so on board with God's mission. So why does he forsake the right specifically in Corinth? I don't think it's super clear, but I think there's at least two possible explanations. I think the first is to avoid misunderstanding. We come back to this principle of the sophists in Corinth, in Corinth over and over and over again. There was this idea of sophist patronage. So this expectation that if you funded a sophist's lifestyle, you would expect some loyalty and favor and good, um, good marketing from the sophist in return. But he wanted to free himself from any indication that he had that obligation. He wanted to prevent further divisions in the church as well, because if one patron is patronizing Paul and the other is patronizing Peter, that's going to only lead to further divisions. Paul wanted to be an impartial leader of the church. He didn't want any hint of parity. Second is to set an example. Corinth was notorious for being materialistic. So he self-supported. 
He didn't want to profit from the gospel in that sort of context because it might have alienated poor members who couldn't afford to patron Paul. So he hits on this right that it is better to love than to enforce. And so for the sake of preserving consciences, he, like because the, the, in, the, in this context, it's their conscience might have been hurt by patronizing Paul. And so this whole point stretches from chapter 8 through to chapter 10. We're going to hear about it in next week as well. It's always better to love than to enforce. This whole situation reminded me of a Shark Tank episode. Um, there's a guy called Johnny Georges, what an incredible name, um, who invented the tree TP. And it was this cone that goes, over, that goes over tree saplings and it saves a ton of water, protects the saplings from storms, and he was only short charging like $4.50 for this thing. And he comes in and he's like, they're farmers. Why would I charge them more than I need to to help them grow their crops? And one of the sharks, Kevin O'Leary, a really nice guy for sure, um, he was pushing back saying, well, why don't you charge like $12, $13? You know, then, you, then there's enough profit, enough fat in there to get me a cut. And Johnny George's as a response was, but you're selling to farmers. And he's the most adorable guy. You should look it up. Um, but Johnny George's had the same principle as Paul here. He had the right to charge more. He could have. He probably would have got away with it. But he cared so deeply about his people, the farmers, that he was willing to forsake that right for their sake. And Paul is challenging us to do the same, to think outside of ourselves over and above others, to fulfill Galatians 5.14, which says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. Or Colossians 3.14, which says, And above all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We're called to live differently to the world. I think this is highlighted in Shark Tank, that that dichotomy. Um, We're meant to be marked by love and compassion and gentleness and and sacrificial living for each other. The world tells us to hold on to our rights to charge the $12 for the tree TP and enforce them whenever possible. Think back to chapter 6 where we talked about lawsuits, where the, the Christians were suing each other for petty things. But Paul's sacrificial life challenges this mindset. True Christian freedoms isn't, is, is incompatible with over-enforcement of rights. In fact, true Christian freedom is the willing laying down of those rights for the gospel and for others. Think about how this impacts how we live. How does it impact how we spend our money? We're entitled to spend it however we want. But if our motivation is love for our fellow brothers and sisters, I think it should impact our spending habits. It should impact how we spend our time. Maybe we give away a weekend for the sake of others. Or our homes. I think we treat, especially in Western Australian culture, we treat our homes as this personal retreat where no one's allowed in. But maybe consider how it would impact a discipleship group or community dinners or housing someone. This would be a huge sacrifice to your right to privacy and it would be a huge inconvenience. But it presents like huge opportunities for ministry and for gospel witness. I think this is especially challenging, this whole passage, to ministers and missionaries. This was particularly challenging to me. I don't think all ministers or missionaries need to take no wage. But the challenge that came to me, and I hope any of you that would be considering ministry or missions, is that would you do this for free if it would impact your gospel witness? I would like to think I would. I hope I would. But God willing, by the Holy Spirit, I don't have to. I don't know. I don't want to, but I will if needed. That's that's the conclusion I came to, at least in my head. (laughs) But Paul's not just concerned about loving believers. This is a huge part of his ministry. He's hugely passionate about it. But his goal, his fundamental goal, is to spread the gospel that he holds so dear This gospel that saved him on the Damascus Road, this took him from a guy who wanted to kill Christians and was just passionate against Christ. 
to someone who is so overblown with God's mercy and kindness to him that he can't help but spread it far and wide. This leads us to our final principle, the proliferation principle. For believers, the spread of the gospel must take priority over all areas of life. Paul's ultimate priority was the advancement of the gospel, and he willingly sacrificed his rights and his entitlements and preferences for that purpose. The mission of sharing Christ with the world with no right, no desire, no pain, too great. This shapes his entire identity. Look at verse 19. We'll read through to the end of the chapter. Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law. Though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel so that I may share in the blessings. Don't you know that the runners in the stadium all race, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul demonstrates his absolute commitment to the gospel. And he does this in four ways. To the Jews, he was already a Jew, but this creates this distinction between his Jewish ethnic heritage and his new identity in Christ. His identity in Christ as a saint, someone changed, transcends his cultural loyalties that he might have. What does this mean as Australians? Are we Australian first or are we Christian first? But Paul was able to adopt the Jewish traditions, adopt the Jewish mindset for the sake of evangelism. To those under the law, these are converts throughout the empire. They were the same as Jews. They, took the same, they followed the same laws as the Jews. They were kosher. They followed the right feasts. And he showed them respect. He kept their conscience clear. We saw this in Timothy um, in Acts chapter 16, where Timothy got circumcised for the sake of the gospel. Now, that's the handing over of a right. Um, I think, it, but, but it made the message more readily received. So worth doing as far as Timothy and Paul are concerned. Um, but that's, that's commitment. To the third group, those without the law. These are the Gentiles. Now, many of their practices were unequivocally immoral, and Paul is, saying, Paul is not saying you can engage in immoral actions for the sake of the gospel. He says in verse 21, I am not without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. There's this law that is eternal and binding on Paul. He can conform all of his preferences, all of his entitlements, all of his rights to fit within the culture. What he can't do is conform his, the law of Christ to fit within the culture. So he didn't conform entirely. He didn't engage in sin or immorality, but he was culturally sensitive. And the outcome was a church in Corinth that was thriving. This hedonistic culture somehow accepted Paul and his law of Christ. Paul's final group is the weak. This is probably not the same group as those in chapter 8. It's probably the poor and the lower socioeconomical classes. And Paul wants to identify with this group the most. He wants to be self-supporting. He wants to offer the gospel freely to them without cost. There's no barriers to entry into Christianity. There's no moral ladder you need to climb. There's no amount you need to give in cash or anything like that. 
the church stuffed this up in England at one point. They were charging a fee to get through the door to sit in a pew. If you couldn't pay the fee, you sat outside the church. I have serious problems with that, and I think Paul would have serious problems with that. What's interesting is he didn't have a category for the strong. He didn't make himself strong so that he could minister to the strong. But this brings us back to our central point. It's the duty of the strong to accommodate the weak. Fotopoulos argues that Paul is actually calling out the strong. The strong are actually in the wrong, it seems, I think, in Paul's mind. They're enforcing their right to the detriment of the weak. Kemper and Rosner argues that this passage actually demonstrates the spiritual immaturity of the strength of the strong, not their maturity. That's the point of verses 24 to 27. Athletes train, whether you're boxing or you're running, it requires a ton of discipline. We saw this in the Olympics. You have to be the best of the best of the best to compete. Believers are called to exercise similar self-control, to have discipline over your desires and your rights, discipline over your prideful desire to enforce your entitlements, Discipline over your personal preferences, over what clothes you wear, what food you eat, what movies you watch, what language we use. We must live lives that are marked by discipline because we need to direct our love outside of ourselves. Our motivation should be to love others and to make the gospel known, not to enforce our rights. We want to make the gospel known to the Jews and to the Gentiles, and we want to do it with love and gentleness and kindness, not by enforcing our preferences on them. This has been a a missionary failure throughout the years, as I said before, bringing essentially colonial power and making that synonymous with the Christian message is a huge problem for the gospel witness. Um, It's imposing preferences where there is no need to. And this erodes trust and it's presented huge challenges in places like South America where there's still that sort of lasting imperialism that's a problem. But back to Hudson Taylor, I'm going to finish this sermon with with just an extract from one of his letters. Um, It's a little lengthy, but I think it's worth listening to. I've modernized the language a little bit to sort of make it more palatable. But yeah, listen in and we'll, we'll read the whole thing. We are dealing with a people whose customs and traditions have developed over centuries, even millennia. Their preferences aren't baseless. Those who know them well understand and respect these customs, recognizing their necessity due to the climate, resources, and the unique nature of the people. China is perhaps the most religiously tolerant country in the world. The only objection they have to Christianity is that it's seen as a foreign religion with a tendency to align believers with foreign nations. I'm not alone in believing that the foreign dress and mannerisms of missionaries, sometimes adopted by their converts and students, the foreign appearance of chapels and the overall foreign vibe associated with the religion have significantly hindered the spread of Christianity in China. But why does Christianity need to appear so foreign? The Bible doesn't require it, nor does it make sense to insist on it. Our goal is not to strip away their cultural identity, but to bring them to Christ. We want to see Christians in China who are true believers, but also truly Chinese in every way. We hope to see churches led by Chinese pastors and leaders worshipping God in their homeland, in their traditional clothing, in their native language, and in buildings designed in a distinctly Chinese style. And this is the key part. If we really want to see this happen, we should lead by example. Let's adapt to their ways as much as possible, becoming Chinese in every way that isn't sinful, so that we might save some. We should wear their clothing, learn their language, and try to understand their habits and diets. Let's live in their homes, making only necessary changes for health and efficiency. Later in that same letter, he emphasizes the main reason for this adaptation. Let the love of Christ motivate you to connect with the Chinese people and present your message in a way that honors Christ. 
Don't hold back. Fully dedicate yourself to him and you won't be disappointed. This echoes Paul perfectly, doesn't it? I feel like Hudson Taylor was reading this passage as he was writing this letter. And our calling as believers is to love others at the cost of ourselves. What would this look like at your work, at your uni, at your home, at your mother's group? Just think about what it looks like to give away your entitlements and rights to preserve your gospel message, to prioritise others daily, to live out Philippians 2, chapter th- verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which challenges us. Lord, we pray that as we think about uh, this passage this morning, you would um, encourage us to think outside of ourselves, to live lives that reflect the tremendous gospel that you have given us, the message of love and reconciliation that um, you have given us. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, yeah, set it on our hearts to live lives that love each other and love this world so much that we can't help but share this good news of salvation. Amen.